<laughs> okay, so I'm here with Seth, Seth Shostak, and he is representing SETI in this conversation. And Seth, before we get to the questions, could you just tell us what, for those who don't know what SETI stands for, and also what your position at SETI is? Well, I actually work for the SETI Institute, which Got is it. a nonprofit organization interested in the question of life beyond Earth. And my, uh, my position is senior astronomer. Senior astronomer, do you also have administrative duties? I don't have too many administrative duties, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. And um, what is the mission or the goal or the objective of SETI Institute? But the SETI Institute uh, has about 100 scientists, uh, PhD scientists, and uh, they're interested in finding evidence for life elsewhere, uh, all but maybe one of them, that is to say myself, uh, are interested in life within the solar system. In other words, life nearby. Microbes under the surface of Mars. Uh, there are three moons of Jupiter, two moons of Saturn, all of which have liquids and consequently might also have biology. So you say that um, you're interested in further, further planets, is that right? Exoplanets that are beyond the solar system? My interests are in fact in the uh, searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is what the acronym SETI stands for, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And indeed, uh, I partake in the projects to, you know, try and eavesdrop on aliens, uh, radio broadcasts, radio signals, I should say, they're not necessarily radio broadcasts, or flashing lasers, or even to look for massive artifacts constructed by societies that might be very much more advanced than we are. Kind of like that uno muno idea. Is that how you pronounce that? That Avi Loeb's idea that the oh umua mua, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that is, <laughs> yes. Uh, Avi Loeb has said that he believes that umua mua could be an alien spacecraft. Uh, he's pretty much alone in that opinion. The people who study asteroids think that it's an asteroid. Right. But that would be the kind of thing a massive artifact. That, that, could, that could be something, although that came into our solar system. So that, that's a little less likely. But uh, you, you might find something like what are called Dyson swarms or Dyson spheres, very large constructions designed to collect solar energy, not from our sun, but from somebody else's sun. Uh, you could see those at great distance. So there have been some searches for those sorts of things. But anything else that's you know truly massive that you can find with a, with a telescope might be a hint that there's somebody out there who's very much more advanced than we are. And by massive, I'm going on a little bit of a deep dive because I'm curious. Um, by massive, do you mean actually with a lot of mass? So in other words, um, uh, you don't care about diameter, you care about mass, or do you actually mean diameter? I mean diameter, I mean size, I mm -hmm. mean size, so that you can see it. Mm -hmm. So you're and interested so that in- it radiates, for example, a lot of infrared uh, light, which would of course be easy to detect as well. Well, right. So our sun is a massive object that radiates infrared light. So how, so, right. So in fact, any star is that. So why is it, I'm just curious. I don't understand the diameter distinct. I mean, there's so many big diameter natural objects. So what is it like, is it bigger than those or what is the, well, if why, you had why something, diameter? Yeah. I mean, consider what you can see with a telescope at a, a distance of say 10 or a hundred light years away, you can only see things that are big or that are very bright, right? And if they're not big, bigger than, well, comparable to say the orbit of uh, Mars or Jupiter, something like that, that, that sort of size, that's very, very large. That's close to a, you know, a billion miles across. Uh, you, you might see something like that just by making photos of the sky. You might also detect something that's actually smaller but that is very warm, that in, you know, it emits uh, light radiation in the infrared, something that you don't expect to find in the depths of space, unless it's connected with some sort of star system, a natural phenomenon, but to look for something that isn't natural, uh, something that's, as they say, emitting a lot of infrared radiation. Well, so, okay, we're gonna get down, down and deep with the kinds of data that you look at at SETI. 
And sort of in that context, I guess I sort of, I, I'm trying to understand why um, emitting infrared radiation, which is, are you talking about infrared radiation in certain frequencies that aren't the same as the frequencies that stars emit? Or like, how, how are you distinguishing? So you say that, that you're looking for things that are non-natural. How are you, how would one distinguish a natural from non-natural object, regardless of whether it's in our solar system or elsewhere? Yeah, well, that's not easy to do, of course. Right. But uh, I, I was referring to the detection of a source of infrared radiation. Infrared is just, you know, another wavelength of light, if you will. It's like ultraviolet, but it's at the other end of the spectrum. If you go to deep, deep, deep red, you know, eventually you get to infrared. And infrared is emitted by anything that's warm, including yourself, by the way. But if you were to take a photograph using an infrared camera of uh, you doing the ironing, the ironing... <laughs> It involves an iron, which is very warm. And consequently, that would show up as being very bright in the photo. Well, by taking an infrared camera and aiming it at the sky, you see things that are, you know, warm, right? Uh, the new James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. It photographs the sky in infrared light, not visible light. And as a consequence, you can see things that ordinarily you would not see because uh, you know they don't emit much in the wavelengths of light that your eye is sensitive to. So the distinction you're making now, I understand, is you're basically mentally talk, you're mentally placing or maybe physically placing um, a visible light spectrum image and an infrared light spectrum image next to each other, and something that pops up in infrared but that doesn't pop up in visible you're interested in because that's not likely to be a star, or is less likely to be a star because you should also have visible light with a star. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, you, you could consider doing an experiment like that. There, I, as far as I know, there are no stars that emit yeah, only infrared light and not visible light. That's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. That's pretty hard to do. But dim stars, very faint stars, could have indeed, if they're coming from a star that has a lower temperature, if you will, than our own sun, then it would emit more in the infrared than in the visible. Right, and so then the, the trick is distinguishing something like that from something that is built by an intelligence? Well, yes. If you were to find a lot of infrared coming from a star system that otherwise looked normal, then you would say there's a big construction there. There's something that's you know just being warmed by its own nearby star, and uh, it's not a natural phenomenon. Got it. OK, thanks. Thanks for going on that deep dive with me. Let's get to the next question, but this will all come and relate. Um, so what kind of UAP related do you, data do you work with? And I think what I'm hearing is you look at a lot of spectrum analysis. Is that true? Well, we don't do any UAP research. In fact, okay. the SETI Institute is interested in finding intelligence in the universe, but we're not, you know, the UAPs are all supposedly in our atmosphere, right? We're, we're not looking in our atmosphere. We're looking at the, you know, star systems that are light years away. Excellent. Okay. So none. Is the answer? And None is the answer. Yes. Now let me let me expand the question to to the kind of data you look at. What kind of extraterrestrial intelligence, or possibly a potential putative extraterrestrial intelligence related data, do you work with? Well, we do what Jody Foster did in the movie Contact. We have a set of antennas in Northern California, about three hundred miles north of San Francisco, in the Cascades. And we use that 24 seven, uh, pointing it in the direction of nearby star systems, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us that somebody up there has a radio transmitter. And that's basically it. We also look for flashing lasers. Uh, that's another way you could send bits of information from one star system to another. Uh, that, that experiment is just sort of getting underway now. We're putting the equipment uh, you know, around the world you know, on rooftops or wherever they're going to go. So those are the two experiments that we are doing currently. In the flashing laser experiment, what frequencies of light are you looking for? Well, uh, visible laser light. Okay. So, you know, like if you have a, uh, a laser pointer, for example, right? That's so kind in, of a narrow spectrum. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Lasers yeah. are very narrow spectrum sources. Right. So you're looking at both um, radio. So you're looking at forms of electromagnetic. To be to summarize, you're looking at forms of electromagnetic radiation. Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. 
Okay, taking notes, which is why this thing is shaking because it transmits the vibrations from my laptop, which is down here and to the screen, which is a vibration there. detector. It is. I have built one and it gets in the way of anything staying static on the screen. Um, okay, so what kind of evidence from UAP reports? So this, we're going to go back to UAP, but I, but when I say UAP, in your case, please interpret it as what kind of evidence from extra potential extraterrestrial reports or, or extraterrestrial intelligence, forget bacteria, extraterrestrial intelligence reports, including new data, would your organi organization consider to be good evidence? That's the question. And let me just explain. If you, if your organization, someone in your organization came up with something that convinced you that uh, they had found very likely extraterrestrial, so it could be anywhere in the solar system or outside of the sol solar system, um, intelligence, what would that evidence look like in your context? Well, we're looking for narrow band radio signals. So it isn't that somebody in the organization sort of comes up with it. It's the experiment that we're doing. And uh, it, it's mostly collected automatically, actually, because uh, you couldn't possibly monitor all the incoming data with earphones or, or computer screens or anything like that. There's too many bits per second. There are literally billions of bits per second. Uh, well, but someone has to do the analysis. I mean, it's, it's not the Well, the, the computers do the analysis, yes. So you have artificial intelligence algorithms that go through and analyze things that seem like they're patterns rather than natural, natural no, patterns. Not even that. We're just looking for a narrow band signal. That's it. Just a signal that at some frequency, there's a lot of radio energy coming into the antenna. It's very so simple. In that so sense. you're just doing like spectrograms and looking for a signal above a certain height? Is that yes. the idea? Yes. Yeah. You, you oh. can say it that way. Okay. So that's easy. <laughs> well, it turns out it's not very easy if you're trying to look at 100 million different frequencies at once. But Exactly. So, but the idea so is simple. let's talk about that. So, so what would really good... Um, evidence from that be right i agree that it's not easy so what would it look like like what's the profile that would make you think on, on a spectrogram well we, we we don't really look at it in terms of what the profile would be particularly it's just that at some frequency or some very narrow range of frequencies there's excess radio energy being picked up by the antenna coming from the star system you would consider that interesting if indeed you could verify that it's really coming from the sky, not from a, for example, a, a something in our vicinity, for example, a, a, an orbiting satellite or something. They all send back data on radio beams. And of course we pick those up too, but those we can usually rule out fairly quickly. So you're looking for something that's actually coming from outside the solar system. Uh, and is it one spot on the radio dial? Yeah, so you're looking for a narrowband frequency, but you're but when I said that's easy, you're like not so much, right? And we both know that frequencies can overlap. You've got satellite information coming in. I mean, there's a lot of frequencies. Um, Are you talking about signals? I'm talking about the frequencies of uh, if you look at a spectrogram, there's a lot of overlapping right. signals that will manifest as different powers at different frequencies. There's yeah, those are signals. Okay, signals. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, um, how do you dissect that? How, well, how do, I mean, well we saying. don't have to. We're, we're only looking for a signal. Again, that's at one spot on the radio dial, mm -hmm. right, at one frequency. And if we find something like that, we immediately check it out to see, well, is this a signal actually coming from a star system or is this a signal coming from, you know, 200 miles up, say, our own satellites and stuff like that? In mm -hmm. other words, is it a signal produced by aliens or produced by humans? Okay, so the work is, so I'm just trying to figure out where the work is. So the work is you get a ping from your um, spectro spectrogram monitoring system. And the ping says, there's something interesting here. Then you go check it. You say, is it a narrowband signal? It's only going to give you a ping if it is a narrowband signal. So good, it is. Now the question is, is it from something local? Is it you know, from something human made? Or is it from outside the solar system? And that you would you would only be interested in information that's outside the solar system. And 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 if you and is it true that if you got information that looked like it was coming from the sky and there was also a simultaneous UAP report in that area, that you would ignore it? We because, wouldn't know about it. Where okay, where do I find simultaneous UAP reports? 
I'm saying if you could in the future, like if there if there was a situation where you were well, um, UAPs move across the sky and they move at a speed that we couldn't possibly track with our antennas. So mm -hmm. it's kind of irrelevant. It's it's like saying, well, what about the fact that there are radars aboard many aircraft, essentially all aircraft, right? At least mm -hmm. ab above a certain size, right? And what if we picked up one of those things? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, at the same time that we find something coming through the sky, we actually wouldn't even see it because it's moving so fast that it, it wouldn't register in our system. So if it, so I'm just going to be devil's advocate so that people can understand what you're dealing with. So if it didn't, so if it just sat right at the point where your radar dish was and it stayed there long enough for you to pick up a signal and it was in our atmosphere, would you be interested in it or would you not? Oh, of course, of course. We'd want to know what it is. Okay. We would check it out to, to make sure that it's truly extraterrestrial because, you know, there are 8,000 operating satellites orbiting the Earth. Some of them are in geosynchronous orbit. So okay. they don't move across the sky. They stay in the same position all the time. Uh, most of them do. Most of them are in orbit and they do move around the sky. But, you know, we, we try and uh, map all those and take them out because they're not of interest. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks for answering that question. That's very helpful. So um, what kind of explanation? So there, the, every organization has a, a pile of, we thought it was interesting, it's not interesting, and a pile of, we thought it was interesting, and maybe it is interesting, according to whatever they're interested in. So for you, it's extraterrestrial intelligence. So the question for this organization is what are your piles? So if uh, it sounds like you already have given me some, like um, we thought it was interesting, but it's a satellite. We thought it was interesting, but it's a star or pulsar or something. I mean, I'm just, no. Okay, good. Okay. So tell me the right <laughs> well, answer. Not those, but, it, but that's a technical discussion. Well, but uh, that's, think... that's fine. I mean, that's the point. Like I'm giving you wrong answers so you can give me the right answer. Okay. Well, obviously there are plenty of natural radio sources. You name some pulsars, quasars, hot gas, cold gas, they all emit radio radiation. It's a natural process. But we don't see that stuff because it's not near our band. It's all over the dial, if you will. So that's easy to dispense with. Great. So now let's talk about the narrow band stuff. What what is what seems interesting and then later gets discounted? Well, you pick up a signal, it's at one frequency, right? Mm -hmm. And it's you, you're seeing it when you point your antennas at a certain spot on the sky. But then if you move the antennas a little bit, so you're pointing at a slightly different spot on the sky, if it's really coming from some star system, it will disappear and will reappear when you repoint the antennas back at the star system of interest. Because right? it's That's, so far away. Yeah, yeah, it's far away, but it's actually coming to the direction of that star system. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's, for example, uh, an orbiting satellite and you're just picking up the telemetry of this satellite as it sends signals back down to Earth, you'll pick it up no matter where you aim because relatively speaking, it's very, very strong. And as a consequence, you would easily be able to uh, rule that out as an actual extraterrestrial source in which you're interested. Cool. So question, have there been any, um, this is the next question. So what has your organization focused on in the past? In other words, has there, have there been any instances of signals that where, where you, for instance, find that they're coming from a distant star system? And what could you imagine focusing on in the future? So now that things are shifting in terms of the funding situation for UAPs and for the discussion of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, what could you imagine SETI doing in the future, SETI Institute? doing in the future? Uh, keeping on keeping on or changing, collaborating with other organizations or, or what do you oh, think? I, I, I'm not quite sure what's changing in terms of the funding for SETI. I hope you're right that the funding situation for SETI is changing because it isn't good. It's now run entirely on private donations. But in the past, it was a NASA experiment that was killed by Congress back in 1993. We don't investigate UAPs. We don't have the equipment to do it. And uh, to be honest, I don't know any scientists who believe there, that any of the UAPs are extraterrestrial craft. So that's not terribly interesting to us. We're interested in finding evidence coming from other star systems. That's a different kind of search. I got it. Um, great. So in the future, let's imagine that you had better funding 
and you could do the things you wanted to do, what can you imagine that, that the SETI Institute would do? I think we would build a larger instrument with having that would have more sensitivity to begin with, and also could look at um, more star systems simultaneously than we can now. We want to speed up the search. If you think you're going to find something, if you think you're going to find a signal that would prove that somebody's out there, then you know you want the experiment to be run quickly rather than very, very slowly. So I think that if we had more funding, that's what we would do. Got it. Would you try to build um, uh, a tracking, um, so some sort of tracking radar, I mean, tracking satellite dish that could, I don't know the right words, but I'm imagining that you should be able to track things rather than just have to aim it somewhere and it can't go fast enough. Well, the, the sky rotates once every 24 hours, more or less, right? Because of the motion of the earth. So it doesn't have to be very fast tracking to follow a star system. That's very exactly. simple. So, so would you want to create something like that? Something faster? Yeah. For what? For tracking an interesting signal in a star system as, you, as the Earth rotates. But, but the star systems aren't moving fast, right? The Earth is, so that you could track it for 24 hours. The Earth rotates once every 24 hours, right? Correct. That's 15 degrees an hour. Right. That's a, yes. My that, point is, my point is if I were you, I would want to collaborate with a space agency to actually get information from, I don't know, something that's in geosynchronous orbit or something that's... Uh, well, there, well, well, there are plenty of organizations that do that. That's not our brief, right? Mm -hmm. Can you get those they, data? Could you collaborate with them to get those data? What would they do for us? Give you the data that you with better equipment that you may not have maybe no i mean look there are organizations that track satellites right i mean obviously the department of defense tracks satellites right there are radars we don't use radar of course but there are radars that can see something the size of the baseball 200 miles up right they're they're very good at that that's because they need to know what's in orbit around the earth right we don't need to know what's in orbit around the Earth. So those data are not terribly useful for us. It's like, I mean, those data would be interesting, for example, if you were in the space business and you wanted to send somebody up into uh, the space station or to the moon or Mars or something like that, you want to be sure you don't you know, hit any space junk on your way out of the Earth's atmosphere. So you need to know those kinds of things. You also need to know those kinds of things for defense purposes, right? Who's putting up satellites and where are they? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. None of that is relevant to what we do, of course. We're doing astronomy. Mm -hmm. So if you speed up the search, if you build more sensitivity and you look at more star systems simultaneously, which is what you were thinking would be nice to do, mm -hmm. how would you speed up the search? Well, you could just, in fact, by building more antennas, right? It turns out that this is, this is just a trick of optics. But if you have a, a whole array of antennas, a large array, say hundreds of antennas, then you can using com computational techniques, you can be pointing at different spots on the sky simultaneously. That, this would allow you to, you know, check out not one star system at a time, but maybe a hundred or even a thousand star systems at a time. And that would obviously speed up the search. It's like, a, you know, going to a South Sea Island and instead of digging in the dirt with one shovel, you have a, a hundred shovels or 200 shovels, you know, all of which are digging up the dirt. You might find that treasure chest a little quicker. I think a more um, topical analogy would be like the um, the way that a fly's eye works, a house fly, their eyes work. Their eyes do those computations, right? They divide basically the space up into each of those segments. Yeah, I, I don't know what the resolution of an individual element of a fly's eye is. I don't think it's all that great. I think it has a fairly wide field of view, but I don't know. So yes. <laughs> I just think it's a little bit more uh, optical. Um, so in terms of your hopes and fears going forward, now that people are talking about these things, what do you hope happens in the whole UAP world? What do you fear will happen in the whole UAP world? Well, what, uh, I, listen, the only way I deal with UAPs, it's not part of my job. I understand that that's super clear, but, you're yeah. in the, but I just want to make clear, you're in a context in which the talk of the town is UAPs. And well, so, in some quarters, yes. Yes. And so, and that's the topic of this interview. And so my question is, what are your hopes in that context, given that that's the case? And what are your fears? You know, your answer doesn't have to have anything to do with UAPs because I get that you're, you're looking for extraterrestrial, extrasolar system intelligence. That's super clear. And I think that's great. But 
within the context of what's happening now, I'm curious about your hopes and fears for, for SETI Institute. Well, I don't think I have any hopes and fears for the Institute, but okay. I will say that I hear from people every day who have seen something, right? I, hear, I get reports every day from people who claim that they've you know, seen something in the sky that they think is extraterrestrial. And uh, these people often have photos or videos. They will send them to me on occasion, maybe most of the time actually. And then I can look at them and, and tell them what I think about them. There's that, but that's, that's not my job of course, but I do do that. I've uh, certainly written a lot about UAPs and UFOs and so forth. Personally, I don't think we're being visited. I think if we were, I think if we were, you would have other sorts of evidence, certainly something beyond, you know, witness reports, because those are really v valueless in science. What you would have is that some of those satellites that we talked about earlier, right, would be able to see some of these UAPs. How come, how come they don't see them? How come it's only the Navy uh, and a very small fraction of the Navy that can see these things? And, you know, then you, you get these, these three videos that made the news beginning in 2017. Those can all be explained as very prosaic phenomena, not involving anything spectacular at all, right? So, you know, that evidence isn't particularly good. So I think that if the, uh, the if you will, the UFO community, I know quite a few of the people involved in that, if they want to make their case, that's a make a case that's convincing the scientists they have to come up with some data that are better than what we've seen so far. That's your hope, or is that a fear? Well, it's not my hope. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think we're being visited for a lot of reasons. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me for many reasons, including, by the way, the fact that interstellar travel is just not easy. But beyond that, uh, what what has led them to come here now? Why are we so fortunate that we happen to be living at a time when we're being visited? Yeah, I just I just want to leave you. I don't want to leave you with the impression that so when I talk to people, when I'm interviewing people about this, it's not the case that they all believe that investigating UAPs means investigating extraterrestrial craft at all. Yeah, well, well, if they're not extraterrestrial craft, if they're in fact is simply artifacts of known craft or, you know, effects in the infrared cameras on the F-18 Hornets. Right. I mean, there are a lot of gimbal effects and stuff like that that account for some of the motions that are seen, that sort of thing. I mean, if, if they find that they really can see something and that it can be seen by satellites, uh, some of the 100,000 flights that, you know, lift off every day, commercial flights, right? That it can be seen some other way, then that would be very interesting. I agree. I also think that, um... Uh, many scientists who have been trained in the hard sciences or what has been called the hard sciences um, are unaware that um, all of the cognitive and perceptual uh, faculties that they use to do their craft are dependent on the same brain that is that creates observations. And so when, when people say things like uh, human observation is valueless to scientists, that's not the case. Human observation is actually how you look at your spectrogram. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, but but uh, the spectrogram is not a human observation. No, but it's calibrated to human observation. Everything, every tool we use is calibrated to the human perceptual system. And so I think it's very easy for people who haven't taken coursework in uh, perceptual psychology to believe that a tool is somehow more accurate than the human. The human is inaccurate in certain ways and the tool is inaccurate in certain ways. But understanding the difference, I think, is key to moving forward. So I just like to to point that out. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying there. But on the other hand, if I measure the spectrum of a galaxy using a telescope, right, and I determine how far away that galaxy is based on the redshift I measure in that spectrum, you could say, well, you know, isn't that all suspect? Because after all, it was a human that did the work. I would say it's not very suspect. I know you would. That's because you already, you already told me that. I'm just responding that I think that's because you would say um, it should be suspect. I'm not saying that it's suspect or not suspect. What I'm saying is our perceptual systems are tools that we can use that have certain uh, features and characteristics that we know about. People have been studying for hundreds of years and we know what the limitations of those tools are and we know what the benefits of those tools are. And those are the tools that we've used to shape every single other tool we use because that's all we have. 
And so not to be aware of that or not, or to say that it's valueless to have a human observation, I think is incorrect. I think it has some value. I also think it has great value to use tools. I will use an oscilloscope like the next person, right? It's, it, it, is, it has great value to use tools for what they're good for, but to dismiss the human observation as a perceptual tool that can give us, in fact, gives us the information in the first place, right? The reason we distinguish visible light from infrared is because the human perceptual system is built to perceive visible light so we privilege it. So that's part of how we do our science, right? And so what I'm saying is, I just think it's um, inaccurate to say that human observation is valueless because of what it is what drives- well, I, I don't think I said that. What I said was reports that are you know, done by humans who look up at the sky and see something. I think those are valueless. You said witness reports, you're right. Yeah, you witness, witness reports, reports, that's what I meant by are that. valueless in science. Yeah, I disagree because that's how we know about the phenomenon. Well, okay. You, yeah. you can disagree. Yeah, great. But but then I would ask you, why is this stuff not in the uh, science museums? Um, I think there's a lot of cultural taboo that's have been happening. Okay, but that's a conspiracy theory argument, isn't it? Isn't no, it an argument? It's just from an England? observation. It's just an observation that there's been a lot of cultural taboo about this stuff. I'm not well, saying why, why. Why would there be a taboo? I don't know. Yeah, I'm just I don't observing. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in the field. I'm outside of the field and I'm observing that there's a taboo and I don't know why it is. I think it's very interesting. That question itself is probably one of the most interesting questions. So, all right, cool. Well, thank you. Answered all my questions. You did a great job of differentiating what the study Institute is interested in and what it's not. And we had a little nice back and forth and I feel good about this conversation. Is there anything you want to add? Not really. I mean, I, you know, as I say, I deal with the UFO, UAP phenomenon every day, not as part of my job, but in fact, from my office, or maybe it is part of my job, but we don't, in fact, investigate those sorts of things. And uh, consequently, you know, I can't say that uh, our data is relevant to any of that. It's not the kind of data we collect. It's not, not relevant to the question of, is there something flying through our airspace? But I'm very skeptical that we're being visited. I would, I would add that, and I think most people know that. And the reason for that is that I don't see any corroborating evidence anywhere uh, other than, you know, very specific observations in very specific circumstances. And I think if we were being visited, that evidence would be incontrovertible. Yeah, I have no idea. I'll tell you that. I'm not in the field. So the reason I'm doing this is because I'm looking from outside the field. So I don't have an opinion about whether we're being visited or not. But everyone seems to have a different opinion. But I wanted to point out, just to be clear, you can study UAPs without having an opinion that they're visitations of extraterrestrials. Oh, yeah. Well, the government does that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And not just the government. Uh, I, I add one more thing here. You know, I just gave a talk at, uh, for the Astronomical League in New Mexico. And, uh, you know, we just I, over lunch, we discussed these sorts of things uh, at least once. And, you know, I pointed out to them that given the fact there are hundreds of thousands of amateur astronomers in the world who are looking at the sky with telescopes mostly on clear nights, uh, you know, you can just do a back of the envelope calculation. If it were really something in our airspace, they would see it occasionally and they never do. Yeah, so I don't know what to say to that because I don't know about the data, but I believe you. I, be I believe you that's the I, case. I think that's, an, I think that's an interesting point, personally. Yeah, yeah. I'm not here to find out the truth about UFOs. I'm here to understand the cultural situation that's happening right now. So yeah. that, that's my agenda. Anyway, thank you so much. You're very Alrighty. helpful. Okay, and Julia. Keep on keeping on. Okay, bye.